Good evening and welcome everybody. Hello, Renata. Hello, Jessica. Do you want to say hello today? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Good you know evening. What? Let me see your face. I always love seeing your faces. Nasi, hello. Jerrica, hello, sweetheart. Hello. How are you? Good. <laughs> are you enjoying uh, your time off? You, you relaxed? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's always nice when we have a break from work, isn't it? it a is. well deserved break, I can say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Welcome, honey. Welcome. Jessica, do you want to say a quick hello? Sure. Hi. <laughs> I love the sunshine on your face. We've got the <laughs> Got the sun setting all right we're, we're moving it is i you know we're moving into fall as it started to cool down over there you're starting to get the autumn leaves yeah it's still kind of uh summery it's summery nice well we are <laughs> entering spring here in australia so we've got that transition and we're waxing onto the equinox so you know big energies at play and we're transitioning into the seasons and change of season from a Chinese medicine perspective. There's lots of changes. Renata, do you want to say a quick hello, honey? Want to see your face? Hello. Hello. How are you, honey? Oh, good. That it's photograph so you sent me this morning was incredible. I just see these moments and, like, I just look behind me uh, and take a look. I'm like... Oh, that's really pretty. <laughs> it's amazing how you capture that. You always capture the sunrise or the sunset and it's beautiful. It almost looks like a cubist painting, you know. I almost look, could, could see it in an oils, you know. It'd be amazing. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, just a simple little iPhone doing the work. I know, it's crazy. Well, you've got an eye for detail, honey. So thank you for sharing. Captured certainly the, the beautiful four colours. Loved it. All right, Anya, do you want to say hello? Do you want to put your hi, everybody? Hello, Anya. Hi. Tell us where you're joining us from. We're all jealous. St. Lucia. Yeah. Hello, just Caribbean. Beautiful. Amazing. Welcome, honey. Well, listen, I'm going to make a start. So I'll just do a couple of uh, quick reminders just to mute yourselves. Mute the microphones during the presentation. If you have any questions, remember at the end, if you can turn your camera on. Turn your camera on because I feed off your faces and we'll do the Q&A at the end, so stick around. We're going to be talking, um, diving into an essential topic that's really often overlooked but plays a significant role in fertility, our thyroid health. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone and the often misunderstood condition of subclinical um, hypothyroidism. For many women, the thyroid can be a silent factor influencing fertility with, you know, often there's little or, you know, um, obvious, no obvious symptoms, but its effects are profound. So, I'm going to explore just the subtle imbalances in TSH, and I'm also going to show you how it can impact your ovulation, your menstrual health, and your journey towards pregnancy. So by the end of the session, I hope that you've got a clearer understanding of how to recognize, you know, signs, get the right tests, and support your thyroid health naturally or medically, so you can optimize your fertility and your overall well-being. So let's get started by understanding the basics, right? The basics of TSH and, and its crucial role in the thyroid function. So first of all, the thyroid gland. Let's look at where it is. And if I always love thinking about the thyroid, I, you know, it's like a little butterfly shaped gland. It's just at the front center of your neck, just below the Adam's apple. And it's, it's literally your thermostat regulating yeah, the energy of your entire body. It controls everything from your mood to your menstrual cycles, your metabolism, you know, and about a thousand other biological functions. So it also, you know, your, your ability to burn calories and how easily you lose weight. I mean, it does a ton of things. So it's so important that we're talking about it today. So first of all, let's understand TSH, our thyroid stimulating hormone. That's what it stands for, TSH. And often we don't know what these words mean. 
but I'm going to try and break it down so you understand what you're looking for and, you know, understand that TSH is a hormone. It's produced by the pituitary gland in the brain and it plays a critical role in regulating the function of the thyroid gland. Like that's quite simple, isn't it? So the primary function of TSH is to stimulate your thyroid gland to produce and release thyroid hormones. Now you've got your T3, your triiodothyronine, and your T4, all right? So just break it down and that, that it releases it into the bloodstream. So T3 for short, T4 for short, rather than trying to say triiodothyronine, it's kind of a bit of a tongue tie tester, isn't it? So looking at normal TSH levels, what are we looking for? So they can vary, like there's a big girth here, all right, depending on the lab, depending on the individual, but generally a normal range is between 0 0.5 and 4 millinternational units per litre. Now, however, for trying to conceive and in this fertility niche, many doctors, including me, yours truly, we prefer a narrower range. So typically we want to see it between 0 0.5 and 2. I like to say as close to 1 as possible right, as close to one as possible, that's the Goldilocks zone. So, right, and so I want to, I, when I'm working with my fertility patients, it's just, you know, let's try and get it as close to one as possible. Now, what happens when TSH gets too high, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, it indicates hypothyroidism, meaning that the thyroid is underactive. So it's not producing enough T3 and T4. So in response the pituitary gland it releases more, more TSH in an attempt to stimulate the thyroid gland. So that's where it's confusing because you think high TSH, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's overactive. No, it's the opposite. High TSH means your thyroid is underactive. So symptoms of high TSH. We've got fatigue, all right? Now this is what, this is classical hypothyroidism. So fatigue, sluggishness. We're looking for weight gain. Now, there can be cold intolerance. Often it's the hands and the cold feet. It might be the lower back or even the belly skin, particularly below, below the navel, between the pubis and the navel. All right, that skin is that cold intolerance and a preference for warmth. Um, there's depression. Uh, we can have hair loss. And often even the eyebrows, uh, you know, we lose a third of the eyebrows. So from the, you can often see people with thyroid issues, you know, they're, they're missing. They're like missing the ends of their eyebrows. Um, what else? Dry skin, dry hair. But we've got the menstrual irregularities. We've got fertility issues, so not being able to get pregnant. And then there's another little, you know, this is a little side kick. This is a nice little um, flag for you to remember, but high cholesterol. So this is something to look for on your labs because, yeah, hypothyroidism can lead to high cholesterol because the slower metabolism isn't burning up the fat. So before you go on your diet and your statin drugs, you know, I want you to test, test your thyroid, um, get your thyroid levels checked. So that's a little clue. You know, often we just get put on so many meds, you know, and it's just like, oh, my goodness, I have so many patients that are on like a plethora of meds, sometimes 20 to 40 medications. I've got one patient right now and he's on so many medications. It's it's disturbing how we just get put on meds. All right. So the effects on fertility with the high FSH, it's going to disrupt ovulation. We're going to have irregular periods. Sometimes we can have absent periods. So that's, you know, an ovulatory cycles. Now it can also infect um, embryo implantation. It can increase the risk of, you know, miscarriage and, you know, pregnancy complications. And the main one is preeclampsia, which is a dangerous rise in the high blood pressure. Um, you'll often see protein in the urine with the bloods um, or anemia, okay? It can also increase the risk of miscarriage and your um, preterm birth. I'm going to talk about when it's low. So when it's low, it's again, it's the opposite. So that means it's hyperthyroidism, meaning the thyroid gland is overactive and producing too much. Okay, so that's on the pituitary um, gland. It reduces the TSH production to bring the hormone levels back into balance. It's amazing our bodies. We're, you know, we're always try to, trying to self-regulate, which is incredible. I just think this, this machine is incredible.
Now, symptoms of your low TSH, your hypothyroidism, this is your nervous touch. They're very nervous. They're anxious. They've got rapid heartbeat. Sometimes they can feel it in their neck and ir like really irritable, wired and tired. They're anxious. They're insomniacs. Um, they're, they're rapidly losing weight despite, you know, an increased appetite. Often there's diarrhea because there's a lot of inflammation, um, you know, but yeah, the irregular heartbeat, heat intolerance, lots of sweating, tr even tremors. But the sleep disturbances are really, they play, they play a big impact on this patient. Now, the effects on fertility are quite similar. So, again, we've got irregular periods. They can have lighter or even absent um, menstrual cycles. But, again, it's the difficulty with ovulation making it harder to conceive. And then, again, you've got similarly, you know, we've got miscarriage and preterm birth issues. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'm going to talk more about the subclinical, but we've also got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a, an autoimmune form of hyperthyroidism, and Graves' disease, which is an um, autoimmune form of hyperthyroidism. But today, we're going to talk a lot about subclinical hyperthyroidism because this is, this is, the, this is where we're under the radar. And it's and it's it's a mild form of hypothyroidism, and it's where the, the thyroid function is just beginning to decline, but the body's still producing your normal T3 and T4. All right. So it's you know, it's often this is like the silent types. You don't know, you can't see it until you do bloods, you know, and often it's just a root part of your fertility workup, your routine testing. And you discover it that way. Most of the times, that's how you discover it because it's asymptomatic. Yeah, it gets confusing, doesn't it? So it differs from overt hyperthyroidism because, you know, in subclinical hyperthyroidism, the TSH is it's going to be elevated. So that's your red flag, all right? But your T3 and your T4 are normal. But in your classic, you know, your overt hypothyroidism, all right, the TSH is elevated, but the T3 and the T4 levels are going to be low. So that's the key difference. In terms of symptoms, like I said, you're not going to see a lot of symptoms with subclinical. You know, you may have few. You might have a little bit of coldness, maybe not, or maybe it's resolved, or you might be just slightly balancing, um, you know, addressing weight issues, but you may not. You know, there might be no noticeable symptoms, all right? That's why it's hard to detect. However, with your overt hypothyroidism, on the other hand, you're going to have all those symptoms. You're going to have the fatigue the weight gain, the cold intolerance, the dry skin, the hair loss, the losing the eyebrows, um, the menstrual irregularities. Like with overt hypothyroid, it's very, 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 very obvious. You know, usually you know there's a thyroid issue because you've, you, you, we all know about it. Okay, so how subclinical hypothyroidism, how does it fat affect fertility? This is key, all right? So it's very key because... You know, your symptoms, they're unnoticed. You can't see them. So, you know, what impacts it, it playing on your reproductive health? Well, we're going to have ovulation issues because the elevated TSH can interfere with normal ovulation. So you might be finding your ovulation window is shifting, might be longer, could be shorter. You know, it's that irregular ovulation. All right. Or then you might just start, all right, okay, I've just had an, an ovulatory cycle. Right, making it more difficult to conceive. Um, you might have some, you know, with a subclinical, you might have the menstrual irregularity. So it might be just, you know, um, heavier periods. It could be more painful periods. It could be lighter periods. All right, there could be some more clotting. So these are the things. These are the things that I love in Chinese medicine that we do pick up and we do run you for testing because we start to see those abnormalities. But then, you know, with the elevated TSH, there's an increased risk of miscarriage with subclinical hypothyroidism. So you might be having recurrent losses. Like, you know, you may even feel like, oh, I felt the pregnancy. And then it's, it's like it's an early loss, you know, so a chemical, especially in the first trimester. But then if left untreated, subclinical hypothyroidism can increase the risk of your pregnancy complications, which I mentioned earlier, preeclampsia, preterm birth and low birth weight. 
So why it often goes unnoticed? Because you've got no symptoms. Like it's, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's no symptoms, asymptomatics or very subtle symptoms that you're not even, you know, most women might feel some of these symptoms. Um, so even though it's mild, I think the key takeaway here that is it does still impact your ability to conceive and carry a healthy pregnancy to term. So it's important that we start to do more thyroid uh, panel testing in your fertility workup. So if you haven't done, you know, you, you might be doing your um, blood tests, you might be testing your reproductive hormones, always test the thyroid panel. You're going to remember this after this talk. Always test the complete thyroid panel. I'm going to go through the entire panel. So it's not just TSH. A lot of doctors only test the TSH. But as you know, that's not really testing the thyroid. It's testing the pituitary gland. So we actually need the full workup to understand the complexity and a full case history of what's really going on with your thyroid. So before I move into that testing, we're going to look at about you know TSH and how it affects your fertility. So, you know, ovulation, you know, we're going to have, you know, um, it's going to affect your reproductive hormones, your FSH, your LH, which are vital for the, you know, maturation and the release of the egg. So when your thyroid hormones are imbalanced, then the ovulation may be irregular, the FSH goes up, you know, it's, it's, it's this cascade that starts to happen and how it impedes ovulation. So we actually need to have your thyroid balance for your LH and FSH to be balanced. You see where I'm going with this. We've got menstrual irregularity. We need the thyroid hormones for menstrual regularity. All right, we need it to maintain regular cycles. All right, and an imbalance in thyroid function can lead to longer cycles, shorter cycles. It could be shorter follicular cycles. You know, things start to get, imbalanced you know if it's in the follicular or if it's in the luteal it can be either or um, and you'll start to see that when you're doing your bbt charting which is why i insist on the bbt charting so we can start to find out where these fluctuations are happening so hypothyroidism it can cause you know heavy prolonged menstrual bleeding um, it, you can also then get short or light or absent periods you know um, and then there's, there's the effect on embryo implantation so it, you can see we need this thyroid function to be balanced. It's critical for maintaining a healthy pregnancy, you know, even the development of the fetus. We need thyroid hormones. They're essential for brain development, the nervous system development of the baby. You know, there's just even, you know, pregnancy complications in addition to preeclampsia. We've got gestational hypertension. You know, there's, there's so many things that can start to happen when the thyroid is not working properly. So testing, let's talk about that because it's important. So yes, we want to test the TSH, that's the first thing. But then we want to test your, your free T4, you know, your T4 and your T3. We call it free T4, free T3. All right, now these are the main hormones produced by the thyroid gland. We want to test your antibodies because we want to know straight away is there the autoimmune component? And remember this, that hypothyroidism um, with the Hashimoto's, which is your autoimmune hypothyroidism, accounts for about 90% of you know, diagnosed thy thyroid issues. So we want to test your thyroid antibodies because if it's autoimmune, that will change our treatment. Okay, so we want to know what your TPO, your thyroid peroxidase antibodies, we call it the TPOAB thyroid antibodies, and there's two of them. So the TPOAB, and then we've got the thyroglobulin antibodies, the TGAB. All right, so just think thyroid antibodies, there's two of them. All right, we want to test the thyroid antibodies because autoimmune, there's this rise in autoimmunity. It's almost like this global rise, and it's happening more to women. We're suffering. And then the last one is the reverse T3. So that's your full thyroid panel. And we want, you know, push for it, ladies. Push for it, advocate for it. Because most doctors are like, oh, if, you know, I have to keep everything accountable. But, you know, if you are, you are trying to conceive, you've had some miscarriages or your periods are starting to change, you know, and you feel like this, you know, you're asymptomatic, 
start with the TSH, but really we want to know what the, what's going on. Is there an autoimmune component? It's really important that we know that part because with autoimmune, it changes everything, how we treat you, what medications we need to give you, or what herbs, what supplements are really specific. I'm going to talk about this further on. Um, but yeah, even especially subclinical hypothyroidism, it's not always um, evident from TSH alone. I guess that's the biggest takeaway. All right. So it might be just slightly like if you're if you've got a TSH of four, they'll say, oh, you're in the normal range. But for fertility, we want it closer to two. So if you're if you're getting a TSH reading of four, five, six, push for your thyroid panel, the complete picture so we can see the bigger picture. Because we want to see what your conversions are doing, you know, your T3, your T4, what's happening there. Okay, so what are some, here are some solutions. I always like to get onto the positive vibes now and lift the energy up. But, you know, we want to look at some ways you can manage it. Because the beautiful thing with subclinical um, hypothyroidism is that it can be treated naturally. You don't always have to go straight to medication. So when it's subclinical, I'll often work with my patients. It usually takes around 12 weeks, okay, roughly three months to fix subclinical hypothyroidism. Okay, and you've, it's a combination of lifestyle adjustments and, you know, treatment, uh, dietary changes. I'm going to talk about them. So first of all, if I'm looking at dietary changes, we're going to be looking at iodine rich foods because your thyroid needs iodine. It needs iodine to produce the hormones. So incorporating, you know, some iodine. Where do we get that from? Seaweed. All right, seaweed. I love dulse flakes, but aramid, wakame, nori rolls. There's lots of different. Go into your health food store and find what seaweeds that you can incorporate into your diet. It might even be if you're doing some Japanese, could you have a seaweed salad? You see them in the window. It's that slimy green salad that sometimes it's, if not tasted seaweed, it's a little bit hard to get your head around before you, you know, if, you, if you're not used to eating it. But what it does for your thyroid, it's it's unbelievable. But we've also got fish and iodized salt, you know, these into the diet. Big thing is selenium. Now, selenium helps the conversion of your T4 to your T3. All right, so we want to think about, okay, can we supplement it? 200 micrograms of selenium. That's what I usually would start it at, subclinical hypothyroidism at 200 micrograms of selenium. Now, if you don't want to take pills, and a lot of my patients get pill fatigue because we're already taking our, our, our workup of fertility supplements, I would just get my patients to do one or two Brazil nuts a day. Like simple. I love food as medicine. Remember this, Brazil nuts, one to two. There we go. And there's your 200 micrograms of selenium. All right, but we've got sunflower seeds, mushrooms, fish. Um, in addition, what else? So, zinc and iron. This is really important. You know, we need we need both are critical. You know, zinc and iron are critical for your thyroid function, and it's found in foods like pumpkin seeds, spinach, beef, lentils. All right, you remember, food is far superior. Now, I had a patient today, and she's like, "Oh, I've just been reading about goitrogens." Love that word, goitrogens, goitrogens. It's such an awesome word, isn't it? Get your tongue around that. Now, what that means, they these foods interfere with the thyroid function. So what are goitrogenic foods? They are your brassica family, your cruciferous vegetables. So what we need to do is make sure that we cook them because they are goitrogenic foods are disabled when they're cooked. So cook your goitrogenic foods. So cook your broccoli, your cauliflower, your cabbage. Never eat them raw if you've got a thyroid problem or if you have subclinical hypothyroidism. So this also includes gluten, dairy, soy, millet. These are all goitrogenic foods. And so what I'll do is when I'm working with subclinical or any thyroid issue, I take soy out. I take dairy out. I take gluten out. Okay, so I take millet out, but we keep the cruciferous vegetables in because they work on liver function. Now, I'm going to talk about this further down, but liver function is really important. You know, we need to focus on our liver. So we do want those cruciferous vegetables in, but just cook them so you can steam them. You can bake them. You can saute them. All right. You can blanch them, but we want them cooked, never eaten raw. I hope that makes sense. All right. So 
Just remember, when you cook them, it disables the goitrogenic effect. So low GI foods, all right? We want, you know, leafy greens and berries. We can, we can, we, if it's autoimmune, um, you know, when we've worked out if there's those antibodies, we sometimes I might in the short term do an AIP, an autoimmune protocol, but it's very restrictive. So short term, because infertility, everything's short term, because it's too stressful on the body to do these, these protocols for long term. So six weeks, less than like under 12 weeks and no longer than that. But we're looking at really trying to bring your um, your inflammation down. So sometimes I might just start with an anti-inflammatory diet before I go to AIP. All right. But just remember they're short term. But the big thing is like if you're having a hard time regulating your thyroid function, I want you to look for sources in your life where you can reduce or, or um, you know, reduce exposure to fluoride, bromides, chlorine. All right, these are coming from your diet. So fluoridated water in your toothpaste. All right, other environmental exposures. So plastics, you know, plastic water bottles, straws, you know, you know, even if you're cooking, put them, them into glass, drink out of glass, glass jugs, not plastic. Everything's glass. All right, we're coming back to the old ways. But, you know, leaky gut is another big thing when I'm working with subclinical hypothyroidism because your gut, leaky gut, can cause a thyroid problem. So this is like, all right, because those, those proteins get into the bloodstream and then they trigger the antibodies, which means that, you know, celiac disease can trigger autoimmune reactions in your thyroid gland. Are you following my trajectory? So signs that you have leaky gut. This is a big one. Gas. You got lots of gas. Have you got lots of bloating? Have you got loose stools? So if you don't know about the Bristol stool chart, have a look at the Bristol stool chart online and then start to see, are your stools really loose? We want them about a four. You know, we want them normal, like a nice sausage, long, you know, fully formed stool. All right. But do you have IBS? Do you have food sensitivities, allergies, eczema? skin issues, chronic fatigue, like fibromyalgia, candida, SIBO, right? You can't lose weight. Like all these things, your joints might be aching and swelling and difficulty concentrating because with leaky gut, it affects, it's the second brain. Remember this? So it's going to affect your cognition. So leaky gut can cause a thyroid problem. So some of the lifestyle adjustments. This is the number one. Always remember this, stress. I talk about stress all the time. We can't see it. It's insidious. And stress management is super, super important um, for managing subclinical hypothyroidism or any thyroid condition, okay? Chronic stress affects the adrenal glands and it works in conjunction with the thyroid. So we, wanna, we want to have some practices in place. Uh, I was talking to a patient this morning and we're like, we're just putting two pillars in, 10 minutes, either side, right? 10 minutes of, of just inward reflection, doing some lower diaphragmatic breathing, sitting in stillness with the eyes closed, looking at the tip of the nose or the chest and focusing on be lower belly breathing. So we're really, we call the, the, the uterus in Chinese medicine, the palace for the child. So connecting into your palace, your reproductive space, all right? And you can do that 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon or the evening. So we have these pillars in place. And if you don't have that breathing or meditative practice, it could be something that you start from today. Start putting it in place and watch, watch your adrenals and cortisol levels come down by just doing 10 minutes twice a day. Ideally, we want to push it to 20 minutes twice a day. But when I'm starting out, 10 minutes twice a day is incredible. But we can do yoga. There are, there's guided meditations if you're having difficulty to sit in stillness. Use, you know, I love Sarah Blondin, Insight Timer. She's got this most beautiful Live Awake series. I love her voice, Sarah Blondin. Google her. You know, you can even get the free, she's got some free YouTube videos, but her voice is just soothing because sometimes we've got the monkey mind in this process and it's really hard to get us into stillness. So sometimes having someone's voice to guide us into that safe place is really nice. Um, exercise, time on feet. So we want moderate exercise because that's going to improve your metabolism. It's going to support your overall hormonal balance. And then it's that impact on the thyroid. So the main thing with subclinical hypothyroidism is not to overexercise. We don't want to put any strain on the body. We don't want to worsen the thyroid function. 
All right, so less is best with any thyroid. And that includes the hyperthyroidism. All right, so let's look at now some supplements that you can um, take in addition. So I mentioned the 200 micrograms of the selenium. You can take iodine supplements if you're deficient. So, you know, sometimes I'll even do iodine patch testing on the skin, all right, to see if your skin can absorb it, you know. So you can do um, urine markers. There's lots of tests you can do to see if your iodine levels are deficient. But try testing it on the skin with the Lugal solution. Um, we also have B complex, you know, your B vitamins are super important when there's subclinical hypothyroidism. They're usually in your preconception multi. So you, you're already being taken care of there because we're always looking out for that. Um, we want to support the adrenals. You could look at ashwagandha is another go-to. I love it. Vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium. I think magnesium, anybody with subclinical hypothyroidism or any thyroid condition needs to be on magnesium. In fertility, I actually have every single patient on magnesium because we just, it fix, it's good for everything. <laughs> There's like 300 enzyme reactions that magnesium does in the body. So we need a ton of it. Sometimes we need it twice a day, okay, or three times a day, especially if you've got, you know, reflux, you know. Um, so, but I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. But we also want to treat the leaky gut. So some, some supplements for that. Zinc is really important for the gut. Your zinc levels can be low and ways to test that is, do you have little white spots in your nails? Is, are there grooves in your nails? Are your nails flaky and breaking off? So, you know, this could indicate you've got some leaky gut, but we could do zinc is usually in your preconception multi, but at, at a smaller dose. So if we have leaky gut issues, I will then often do an extra supplementation of, of like your zinc picolinate around 30 um, milligrams of that. No more than 40, but, you know, usually you'll, you'll temper it with your preconception multi. But probiotics, glutamine, marshmallow root, all these things are great for the gut, leaky gut. Curcumin, berberine is another favourite of mine. I like this, especially for my SIBO patients um, and when there's a lot of estrogen dominance. So berberine, aloe vera. Now you can add your aloe juice, you know, like, you know, thimble, like two tablespoons. Um, into your morning ritual. I get every patient to do a morning ritual. We have a glass of water with two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar <laughs> and a squeeze of fresh lemon juice or lime juice, but add in your two tablespoons of aloe vera, okay? And that's going to help with the lining. But we've got bitters, you know, digestive bitters, slippery elm, fish oils. Again, magnesium supports leaky gut. You can even take some betaine and pepsin. You know, sometimes we'll use um, peptides and bone broth. We're always having a cup of that a day. Um, but fibre is super important if you've got leaky gut. Colostrum is another thing. Now, also, so what I've suggested is we reduce the antibodies. If you if you are showing out that with the TPO, AG and the AB antibodies. So we want to look at selenium, I dose selenium. So no more than 400 micrograms of that, but usually I sit around 200. Um, high dose uh, myo and ositol is good if you've got the antibodies. We've got black seed oil. We've also got glutamine um, and glutathione. So glutathione, you can use that topically. You can also use it, um, you could even use NAC because it's NAC's a precursor to glutathione, but they help reduce your antibodies. So what else? Tyrosine, this is another consideration. It's a precursor to thyroid um, hormone. So you can also look at it through meat and pumpkin seeds and avocados. And remember, last thing is essential fatty acids. So your fats. So think of, you know, your fish oils, alga oil, if you're vegan or vegetarian. But think of foods. Always think of it. What foods can I get with my essential fatty acids? So it's your extra virgin olive oil, flaxseed oil, um, nuts and seeds or your oily fish will improve your thyroid hormone levels as our cell receptors they become more able to take up thyroid hormone so it's super important we work on our central fatty acids i mentioned before about the liver detoxification now this is important to manage subclinical hypothyroidism so your liver that's why we keep those goitrogenic cruciferous vegetables in because it works on the liver all right, they're high in dye in dolymethane, which works on the liver. So it helps us metabolize your estrogen. It helps, you know, we need to metabolize our hormones. We need to get them excreted out. We need cruciferous vegetables in the mix, just cooked. But other things to support 
the liver, um, Epsom salt baths. So I have all my patients soaking in 500 grams of your Epsom salts. Now you can do it two times a week. You can do it every second day. I don't mind if you're even doing it daily. All right, but have, have a tepid bath, not too hot, not too cold for about 20 minutes. And then, you know, when you get out of the bath, could you massage in some magnesium oil under the right side of your breast? Because that's where your liver is. All right, so you can topically spray magnesium oil, ancient minerals on Amazon. You can do Amazon Prime and get it delivered overnight. Beautiful. So, you know, use the magnesium oil. I have my patients spraying it on them. Now, if it's stinging the skin, you know you are magnesium deficient. So you might want to add a carrier oil like olive oil or coconut oil. So magnesium oil is great because it's calming, but you can, you know, if a patient, she's, it stings all her body. So she does it on the soles of her feet and it helps her, right? It's very grounding for her. With liver detoxification in Chinese medicine, it's important that um, you go to sleep before midnight because your detoxification happens in the liver between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., so you, it's important that you're in deep sleep. I've got a patient and she's <laughs> being a naughty child. She just keeps pushing it to one and I'm trying to push it back to 11. I try and say, let's get into bed by 10. Lights out, 10 o'clock. So then you're giving yourself that hour to maybe go to sleep if you have initials going to sleep. But remember, every hour before midnight is worth an extra two hours of real-time sleep. So it's great. Wouldn't it be nice to get an extra two hours, four hours of real-time sleep? All right. Sleep is the biggest pillar in this fertility niche. We need a ton of sleep because that's where we rest. That's where we restore. That's where our hormones just rebalance. But other things for liver detoxification, we need fiber, bitter greens. Again, I've mentioned the cruciferous vegetables, those goitrogenic foods, but we want them cooked. We want um, beef liver. You know, they're B vitamin rich uh, lemon peel. Lemon peel is great. So don't throw your lemon peels out. Grate them. Grate it on your food. Grate your orange peel. Like in Chinese medicine, it works on liver detoxification, but it supports the gut function. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's beautiful because it's working simultaneously on both. What else? Sulfur rich foods. We've got broccoli, egg yolks. We don't separate the egg whites and the egg yolks in Chinese medicine. So just eat eat the whole eggs, <laughs> all right? And you can have up to six organic eggs if they're free range a day. So don't be afraid to just have a couple of eggs. I tell my patients to boil them up and then you can just peel them as a snack and it's a lovely little snack that you can have, all right? So what else? MSM supplement, that's another one for liver detoxification. Um, but onions, garlic, all these sulfur-rich foods, they're brilliant for the liver. Let's look at some medical treatments. We've got levothyroxine. This is your T4 hormone replacement. Now, this is generally for those that are um, a little bit above subclinical, you know, and especially if you are trying to see, sometimes I have patients that go on levothyroxine to get you back into the range that we want because it does it quickly. Like it does it within a matter of three weeks, three to six weeks. If you're doing it the natural way, you know, we're looking at takes a lot longer. If you've got the subclinical, it's going to take 12 weeks. So if time is feeling against you, sometimes you can supplement with the T4 supplement. Now, this is your L-troxin, your synthroid, your levoxyl. So this is uh, your T4 hormone replacement. We've also got T3, T4 combination. Okay, and this is, you know, you can um, add in like Cytomol. It's like T3 plus the T4 supplement of your levothyroxine. Um, in addition to that, medically assisted, we've got the Armour Thyroid. So this is the brand name for desiccated thyroid extract to treat hypothyroidism. So it's literally using the extract and it's made from the dried thyroid glands of pigs, okay, porcine source. That's why, you know, um, ethically, I know some of my Jewish clients, they can't take the desiccated thyroid uh, uh, extract. So it's just, you, you've got to understand what's in these medications. That's why I'm, I have these talks so we get to know. But there is the Armour Thyroid, it's WP Thyroid, Nature Thyroid, NP Thyroid. These are, these are different brands that offer the desiccated thyroid extract. So these are some uh, medical solutions. So from a Chinese medicine perspective, remember, I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine. I'm always looking through the lens of Chinese medicine. So 
we look at, uh, you know, the thyroid through the lens of, you know, all the meridians and so what, what patterns might be at play and what's deficient. So we'll often see kidney yang deficiency. We'll see spleen chi deficiency. We might see chi and blood stagnation. All right. So it also it's going to depend on what your individual presentation is, what your differential diagnosis is, because in Chinese medicine, even if you're subclinical or overt hypothyroidism, you know, you know, not everyone gets the same treatment. You know, so primarily we've got to work out what is your differential diagnosis and then we treat according to the pattern. So, for example, if you had kidney yang deficiency, that was your differential diagnosis, I would maybe using things like yogui wan, this is a Chinese herbal formula, um, which often will present, you know, we'll have fatigue, the cold intolerance, the low energy, low metabolism, and jin, jin gui shen qi wan, this is another formula that's a kidney yang deficiency formula. And this is especially good when, you know, there's a lot of fluid retention with the kidney yang deficiency and they still have the coldness. Now we, we use a lot of points on the kidney and bladder. So, you know, on the base of the spine, we call that the Ming Men, do for bladder 23, uh, bladder 52. These points, you know, it's the lower back. You know, sometimes I'll get my patients to actually rub the kidney area. So rub and dum, 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 dum. So you almost do a bit of a, a tympanic drum and you warm the kidneys, all right? Um, if we're looking at something like spleen chi deficiency, so this is, we might use something like bujong yi chi tang. And I might see, you know, in the luteal phase, the chart just drops off. So, uh, you know, we'll correlate that with your signs and symptoms. But with spleen chi deficiency, we it will manifest as gut stuff. Spleen, like, you know, poor digestion, leaky gut, um, fatigue, bloating, all these symptoms, they, they overlap, all right? Um, I might even use, like, if there's blood deficiency, like siwutan, you know, this this can, you might have dizziness, you might have um, menstrual irregularities. I love siwutan. So it's one of those awesome formulas for blood deficiency. Um, there might be some phlegm and damp accumulation. So I'll be looking at something like, you know, urchin tongue, and um, I might be using points on the shins, like stomach 40, and, and I might be using, like, points on the belly, ren 12, pericardium 6, very good for phlegm damp accumulation, contributing to subclinical hypothyroidism. And so with this pattern, we'll see things like sluggishness, poor concentration, and lots of weight gain. So to conclude, I think as you've seen today, the thyroid may be small, but its impact is pretty huge. So whether you're trying to conceive, you're trying to maintain a healthy pregnancy, or you're just simply optimizing your well-being, we need to keep your thyroid function in check. It's 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 non-negotiable. So subtle imbalances, as I've mentioned, you know, the subclinical hypothyroidism, it often goes unnoticed, but it can be the hidden roadblocks standing between you and your fertility goals. So that's why testing, awareness, and being proactive is really important and advocating for the thyroid panel, like really push for it. I think the good news is, is that it's all treatable with the right steps. I think, you know, I hope you've learned that by lifestyle changes, supplementation, or even medical treatments, that you can hold the balance to restore your thyroid and reclaim control of your reproductive health. So I'm going to open up the questions now. Would anybody like to ask me a question? Yeah, Dr. I would. Fiona, I have a question. Um, you said about, this is me, Renata. Sorry. Hi, Renata. I turned off my Hello, camera. Yeah. Um, yeah. I cannot get it back on. Oh, okay. Hello? <laughs> okay, here's coming. Oh, yeah. um, Hello. In regards to foods, such as broccoli has to be cooked. How about sauerkraut? Does count? Does that count? Yeah. Well, this is this is a great question. Love this question because it's fermented. That's the exception to the rule. Like, isn't that okay. beautiful? Yeah, because it's fermented. It's 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 literally fermented food. So that's the exception. That's when you can have it raw. <laughs> okay. Very Got good it. question. Love that question. So I could ferment like broccoli and all those kinds of things well you can <laughs> indeed yeah put them in a jar take out my road trip and eat fermented broccoli yeah okay 
Look, I prefer it. Like, you know that I'm such an advocate for cooked and warm, right? Nothing grows in ice or snow. Remember, your palace needs to be warm. So I would prefer you to make up a beautiful veggie soup and or a chicken broth and bone broth and carry that in a thermos. <laughs> you know, not to say, don't just go, I'm going to just do ferments. Does that make sense? Yeah. You understand what I, I mean? You. you got me? Yeah, but it, I would just, it just posed for me some more flexibility because yeah, if absolutely. I'm on the road yeah. or, or I don't have time to cook, I could do something ahead of time with the fermented. Without a yeah. doubt. Without a doubt. Good question. Good yeah. question. Yeah. And then I know we meet tomorrow, but can we go over like your protocol? Because my, with all the little homework I've been doing, it might have subclinical thyroidism but we don't know with the tsh which the labs haven't come in yet they said it'll come on friday or saturday but they said hi that i was just i saw it in a book and i just confirmed it here online that they said that high thyroid antibodies can actually fake fake or or have a false report on the tsh so we don't even know so i'm just thinking like based on your Chinese medicine diagnosis and everything that had been going on with me, mm -hmm. do I have subclinical? We can talk about that tomorrow, but I'm just, I got, I got thinking. So Absolutely. Which is why you now can see why the th full thyroid panel is really important. All mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. You're welcome. Darcy, go for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I know you had mentioned that if you go on the, the medicines um for hypothyroidism that it only takes a few weeks to correct itself now does do the doctors know that will they suddenly tell you okay like you know come in three weeks come in four weeks let's check your blood and see if they it's corrected itself long, they usually say longer they usually say six to twelve weeks but from my experience when you start taking it it's usually about six weeks that's from my observation with women that start taking it when it's subclinical. Okay. Yeah, pretty quick. Hmm. Okay. But they use Okay. Because I'm will, thinking of just going to my doctor. Usually will test you again in two to three months. Okay. What if, I mean, what, will it harm you if you take, like, you know, if your body is really receptive to medication or anything, if you take it for that long and you know it's working and you, do you, well, you'll you know, know within the first three weeks too much see, see they, they start at a very low dose so you know 50 micrograms you know very very small dose and and basically uh, i haven't seen anyone go hyper in that time right it's normally a larger dose but what you would notice is that Am I starting to get irritable? Am I starting to get anxious? Am I starting to lose weight too quickly? Am I starting to show the hyperthyroidism? So you you watch for the symptoms, all right? But generally, I haven't seen that happen. That's not been my experience with someone taking a very low dose of it. It usually corrects okay. it and brings you back to normal. Okay. And at that point, do they usually get you off of that? Like, let's say your body's responding well. Problem. Do they, they usually... don't often get you off it. So that's where you have to advocate for you. That's where you go, right, okay, this is subclinical. I wanted to bring it back quickly. Um, I'm going to wean myself off this now and focus on my lifestyle factors, my nutrition, my supplements. And then you could retest in three months and see if that was effective. Did you actually do it? Because often what happens is women just get left on this medication forever. Yeah, I don't like to take a medication forever. So. No. I mean, the, one thing is when we do actually uh, uh, have the baby, I often see a lot of thyroid problems happen. You know, in that you know postpartumly, and and don't I, I just want I think this is a big takeaway too that women suffer from um, an underactive thyroid often in that postpartum period, and they're so down. They're so down, they're so depressed. So often, you know, supplementing that in that postpartum period is a good idea. And it can lift up, you know, affect the bonding of the mother with the baby. So don't be afraid to take it. I've not seen any adverse effects of it. That's been my clinical experience with people that take it. If you want to take it short term, don't be afraid of that. Um, and, and don't be afraid of it postpartumly as well. I think that's a big key takeaway. Okay. 
Just yeah. curious. All right. Thanks. Any other questions, Darcy? No more, I guess. That was all. <laughs> Anya, do you have a question for me? Or Gemma, do you maybe have a question? Anybody? Does anyone have any more questions? Oh, Anya, I can hear you talking, but can you unmute yourself? Can you unmute yourself? Do you want to unmute yourself? I can't I can't hear you, sweetheart. <laughs> Maybe I can't get you to unmute. We can't hear you, Anya. So I'm going to uh, do another round of questions. Jessica, do you have a question for me? Maybe, perhaps. Well, ladies. I, I had one had and one. then I lost it. <laughs> oh, that's totally fine. Okay. And I can't think of it now. <laughs> I have one. How many, you talked about two Brazil nuts a day. How many grams or milligrams of selenium is in two Brazil nuts? Just about curious. About like Yeah, roughly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Indeed. Cool. And you said to take 400 milligrams of selenium. 400 micrograms, no more than. But that's why it's 200. 200 micrograms is usually for a supplementant or two Brazil nuts, which is about 200 micrograms. Okay, got yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. All what, right. What? She brought up another question that I am now like concerned about. Like, why can't we take more than, I'm sorry, you can't see me, but I think, why can't we take more? Why can't we not take any more than those two? Like, what, what would too much selenium do? Well, too much, it's it's like conversion. The liver's got to convert it. So it's going to work on your methylation pathways. So remember, everything that you ingest, the liver has to break it down. So we don't want the liver to then have to have methylation issues because you're taking too much selenium. Remember, the body is designed to, to, to process things and do it in a balanced way. So that's why we have um, dosages on, on, on most products. You know, too much of anything, too much sugar, not good for you. <laughs> it's always about finding the moderation. Yeah, but it's going to affect your liver pathways, your, your detoxification pathways in the liver. So we want to keep that um, in a safe space for you. Okay. Thanks. So, ladies. I have a question. Oh, when got... using primrose oil, yeah. so the primrose oil can be used as a carrier oil for the... Magnesium? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Any oil for that matter, but yeah, absolutely. Got it. Fantastic. And then with the primrose oil, if you're using it by itself, where yeah. would you place it at? Well, if you want to put it topically on the, you know, you can put yes. it down, down near the ovaries is really good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Down near the palace. Okay. All roads lead to the palace. So ladies, thank you for joining me for our weekly live Zoom meeting. As you know, each week I am discussing a different fertility topic and then I'll answer all your fertility questions. So always feel free to, you know, send me some recommendations for topics, things that you would like me to research and present because this is our open forum and it's where we learn and we grow together. So have a great evening. Thank you for your message, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.